1953, with its empire everywhere falling into decline, the British government tried to put together a huge new state in Central Africa. The colonial secretary said, We, the British, are seeking to build a society founded upon partnership between the races that inhabit Central Africa. We believe that the present scheme provides a framework within which the idea of partnership can take root and grow. But the leader of the white settler community there had different ideas. Sir Godfrey Huggins stated very clearly that the type of partnership that they wanted between black and white was such the same partnership as existed between the rider and the horse. The new state was called the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland. It advertised for new white immigrants. This is one of the few countries which can still offer a comfortable life with free ways in a climate comparable to any in the world. And hundreds of families have settled down here to give and receive their share of a prosperity growing faster than anywhere else in Africa. Every white man expected to be called Inkosi or Mambo, that is king. Every European housewife was called queen. Every European daughter was princess. Every European son was prince. The whole European community was composed of royalty. The opposition to the Federation was not a question of being against bigger political units. This was a question of the fear that we had as Africans, that the settlers were beginning, beginning to create conditions, political and economic, social and cultural, for another South Africa. This was done against massive opposition. We petitioned the Queen several times. Uh, I was Secretary General of the African National Congress then, and uh, so we really worked very hard, but we failed in the end. It was imposed on us. The idea was to try and get a truly multiracial society uh, in the center of Africa, having an influence on South Africa to, uh, on the one hand, and the northern Africans who were moving to independence uh, on, the, on the other. And of course it was a very legitimate purpose and a high ideal. If it could have been done, it would have had, I think, uh, you know, a, a big effect. The scheme affected three colonies that Britain had held since the 19th century. The British hoped that federating them together would realize the elusive ambition of racial partnership was up against awkward facts on the ground. In Nyasaland, a mere 8,500 whites were outnumbered by 300 to 1. In northern Rhodesia, 70,000 whites by 30 to 1. And even the largest white community, the 200,000 in southern Rhodesia, by 12 to 1. These racial imbalances were compounded by differences in the political development of the three territories. In southern Rhodesia, white voters, with the few blacks who had been given the vote, elected an all-white parliament. They ran their own government. In the two northern territories, colonial governors, appointed from London, ruled with the help of advisory legislative councils. The coming of federation meant yet a fourth legislature, with members both elected and appointed from all three territories. Further, Britain had two channels of direct involvement. The Commonwealth Office, which had long dealt with southern Rhodesia, now also dealt with the federation. And the Colonial Office dealt with northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland. 
Thus, two Whitehall offices dealt with three territories, having four governors, and with five governments having a say. The Federation began amid hectic European optimism, personified above all by one man. Once a heavyweight boxing champion, organizer of the train drivers union, and by the coming of Federation, one of the leaders of the white community. My dream for Federation was a simple one. I believed that the economies of the three territories brought together would offer a much greater prospect for the development and the advancement of its people. Uh, and you mustn't forget that even before Federation, there was a considerable amount of association. The currency was a common thing for the area. The railways were, all were common between the two Rhodesias. The airways were common between the two Rhodesias. There were a host of things, and everything looked to me to be much more rosy if the three of us could get together. In the first five years, the rosy economic forecasts for the Federation were amply fulfilled. Salisbury, capital of both Southern Rhodesia and the Federation, became one of the fastest growing investment centers in the world as hundreds of millions of pounds poured in. Here at Kariba, a dam was built, creating the biggest man-made lake in the world to harness the power of the Zambezi River and bring cheap electricity to the Federation. Above all, it increased the efficiency and profits of the Northern Rhodesian copper mines. The Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasland could not have survived the length of time it did if it were not for copper mines of Northern Rhodesia. In those days, copper fetched very good prices on the London Metal Exchange. So there was a lot of money. And all that money went to Salisbury. We were given a small portion of that. Nyasaland was given a small portion of that. But yeah, the most of all of it went to develop southern Rhodesia. There is no doubt that the Federation gave southern Rhodesia a tremendous boost in those days. Northern Rhodesia was powerful economically because copper was booming. So we gained tremendously from those economic advantages. For a rising young Southern Rhodesian politician like Ian Smith, the Federal Assembly was obviously the place to be, but it was not without surprises. I haven't seen this picture for a long time of the first Federal Parliament. This was, of course, the first time we had had this concept of a multiracial parliament with black people in the parliament. And I was surprised at how able some of them were, particularly Wellington Chair, one of the most able parliamentary debaters I think I've ever met. Uh, there were only six, six of us as African members of parliament. I remember a number of people in this picture. There is Sairoi Walensky there. He was always heckling me and I heckled him back. I've always held him in great respect, and I often warned my own uh, colleagues in the House to be careful in, in interrupting him. He was one of the few Africans that was very eloquent, very able to think, and think on his feet. He had a facility for rattling Roy Walensky when Roy was Prime Minister. And uh, we all commented on that, even Roy's friends. We had also an implacable enemy in Ian Smith. He looked at us with contempt and actually said that we'd never get independence at all as black people because he believed that we're incapable, backward, and unintelligent. And indeed, there are several of them there. The majority of them were very much opposed to us. I'm no supporter of one man, one vote today, so my view hasn't changed since then. I believe that a quality to franchise is the answer, and I still believe that. Why is that? I believe that, that you get much better representation uh, of, of the country if you set down minimum qualifications for people to vote. If you give people something for nothing, they don't really appreciate it. Although the introduction of Wellington Chiwa and five other blacks in the Federal Assembly was Britain's attempt to steer Rhodesia away from a South African style of politics. 
The 26 elected white members won all the votes. 14 of them represented the most established white community, southern Rhodesia. It was clear where the pressure would come. One of the biggest problems that faced the federal prime minister at any time, whether it was Huggins or myself, was the need to carry southern Rhodesia uh, with one in any decisions that were taken. People are apt to forget that southern Rhodesia was the only other consenting party to the creation of the federation. The two northern territories were put into the federation by Her Majesty's government, but southern Rhodesia held a plebiscite on it. I think the older brand of white Rhodesian was much more tolerant than many of the newcomers. Uh, we brought in a tremendous number of immigrants uh, as the federation developed. We needed their skills and that kind of thing. It was selective. A lot of them were people from the United Kingdom, but also quite a, a large number had come from various other parts of what was the British Empire that was then beginning to fall to pieces. And these people, many of them were in fact fighting the sort of last round of the British Empire, the last round of the bout. Sir Godfrey Huggins, he of the rider and the horse, long Prime Minister of Southern Rhodesia, moved up to be first Prime Minister of the Federation. So it became necessary to elect a new leader in Southern Rhodesia. The idealism of the Federation really attracted me because we were going to work together this whole big organ this whole big area of land with all its peoples and i knew it could only be successful if we really worked together and if we persuaded the people to come along with us in southern rhodesia the whites only really had a vote they voted for it they were prepared to change their ratio of whites to black from about one to sixteen to i think about one to sixty in the wider federation that made me believe that they were sensible enough to see that there would have to be a complete change of attitude. He was prepared to lower standards in order to provoke advancement of the black people. That, that was his dedication, to bring on the black people. Well, I, I think most Rhodesians were sufficiently sensible to realize that it had to take place. But they believed it should be controlled that we should have some sort of a, a qualification. If you made any move towards sharing power, you were going too fast. <clears throat> but in fact, of course, I was going far too slow. Um, unless we had been prepared, all of us, to go a lot more quickly than I was going, I'm afraid we couldn't eventually uh, escape civil war. Very sad that that's the way it was. Todd's government annoyed many whites when it announced that in future, African males should be addressed as Mr, not boy. But when he proposed modestly to increase the tiny number of African voters, and said sex between the races should not be a crime, his cabinet finally rebelled. The fall of um, Gaffel Todd was important for us in that it removed a very powerful white uh, liberal whose word uh, had been believed by most of the whites. Uh, but we had come to the conclusion that no white liberal could help, could advance the African cause because uh, white liberals uh, were preoccupied with the question that the white men should rule the African fairly whereas the African himself was preoccupied with takeover politics. In the end, as we all know, Garfield Todd came unstuck, not because of outside people, but because of the people within his organization. They came to the conclusion that he was going too fast, and they were the instigators of removing him from office. So his reign was a short one, maybe quite an exciting one as far as he was concerned, but. He misjudged it. With Todd's fall, the slim hopes of partnership between the races in southern Rhodesia had disappeared. But the British government continued to back the Federation. <laughs> hopes for African advancement in the two northern territories did not lie in the hands of the white settler community, but with the colonial office in London. Nyasaland, described by Sir Roy Walensky as an imperial slum, had only been thrown into Federation as an afterthought. Britain's neglect of this backwater was now to make it the primary battleground for the survival of the Federation. 
Now, Essenland was a small country, and uh, I'm afraid its priorities slipped, although we genuinely were going to do things for them. We kept on finding that other things cropped up which seemed to us more important. And uh, so they got left behind. I think it really is as simple as that. There was no idea of letting them down or anything, but it just failed on its, uh, against other things. Nyasaland nationalists had opposed the Federation from the beginning and had expected the British to protect them. But their concerns were consistently overlooked. They decided to appoint a leader who would have some impact on the colonial office. Well, there was a conference of the Nyasaland African Congress in 1957 in Blantyre. It was at that conference that it was decided that I was the only man who could lead this country. I was then practicing medicine in Kumasi, Ashanti, in the then Gold Coast. So I received a telegram saying that, please, come home. On July the 6th, 1958, Hastings Banda came home. For 40 years, he had lived abroad, mostly in the United States and Britain, and he had forgotten his native language. His return was an impressive moment. I said I had come back home to do two things to break their stupid federation, I used to call it, and to give you, my people, your own government. So that they were not left in any doubt at all about it, because I repeat, I did not hide it. I don't believe in about, about beating about the bush. I was blunt from the very beginning. I'd met Banda in London before he came back to Nyasland, and um, I, I remember recording in my diary uh, that um, he was a fanatic to get Nyasaland in the, made independent and to break up the Federation. He set off on tours right through the Protectorate and tens of thousands of people came to his meetings. He started to build up a very tense atmosphere that uh, he could get independence for Nyasaland if they stood behind him. Banda and his fellow nationalists were in a race. Federation's first phase was to end in 1960. Walensky and his white supporters were campaigning for full independence to be given to them then, with the government firmly under the control of the settlers. When the Federation was formed in 1953, it was supposed to be tentative. It would either confirm in seven years or in ten years. And after that confirmation, there would be no looking back. I did not want that confirmation to come. I did not want this country to be up part of a federation or a union like that or the Union of South Africa. So I wanted to make sure that when that review came, Nyasland was out. Whatever Northern Russia and Southern Russia did, that's their business. But Nyasland had to be out. Under Banda's leadership, nationalist protest took a sharp upturn. Rumors ran through the white community of plots to wipe out all Europeans. On January the 25th, 1959, Banda's colleagues held a secret gathering known as the Bush Meeting. Informers told the police that a murder plot was hatched there against, among others, the governor himself. What was meant at the Bush Meeting was to discuss and advise ways of passive resistance. They accused us of plotting the murder of Europeans, but that was not the case at all. It was mainly to advise our delegates who came from all over the country methods how we could apply the passive resistance. That was our main thing. Although on such an occasion, you know, you would have sometimes hot heads and they would uh, shout, oh, well, what about poisoning this and that? But this was not the basic idea of the whole Bush meeting. My special branch had had the meeting analyzed 
and we knew therefore that they were going to start putting the conclusions they had reached into effect. They began doing this quite early in February and they put out of action the airfields at Fort Hill and Karonga. They destroyed the roads by cutting ditches across them, felling trees across them, and um, generally creating the build-up to what uh, we thought would come, an attack on civil servants and other Africans in authority. As far as Armitage was concerned, I asked him a question. And the question was whether he could guarantee the safety of the, the Europeans and other people who might need protection in uh, Niceland if the trouble which we foresaw that was going to happen, could he guarantee their protection? And he said, no, he couldn't. He did not have sufficient forces to, to, to do that. So it was in those circumstances that I took the decision to send up the first white troops to go and occupy the airfields and do that kind of thing to make certain that we could keep communications open. To the blacks of Nyasaland, the arrival of southern Rhodesian troops seemed to herald what they had feared all along, a white settler federal takeover. On March the 3rd, 1959, Sir Robert Armitage declared a state of emergency. Dr. Banda and 1,300 other Nyasaland activists were detained. I was in a, in a hospital. Uh, this was two days after the birth of my baby. We drove straight to Zomba prison and I was told to get out of the car. And there were other soldiers who were waiting for me. I couldn't get up because then I was really weak and uh, as you know, uh, a woman after delivery. I was wet, but I was forced out. I had carried my baby in my arm. I got out of the car, really dripping to the ground. And I was pushed through to the door. I staggered around. I almost collapsed, but I, start, I tried to stand. And then I was taken into the room where I was searched. The doctor decided that I should go to the hospital immediately because I was not well. This didn't happen. Mrs. Chibambo and her baby spent the next 13 months in prison. In the north of the territory, arrested local Congress leaders were held on a ship in Nakata Bay. A crowd of Africans were trying to get to the ship and set them free. A young district commissioner faced them pleaded with them, and then read the riot act to them. To help him hold back a thousand angry Africans at the dock gates, he had five white soldiers of the Royal Rhodesian Regiment. The sergeant twice requested permission to open fire. Um, once he requested, and, and I said no. Um, and it went on for some time longer. I was desperately hoping that the reinforcements would appear coming down the hill. He asked a second time, and again I refused. And then, in due course, he said, well, I, I can't be responsible for containing them any longer, or words to that effect. And I felt that I had no alternative in the circumstances because by then the gates were forced pretty wide open and he had only got four men under his command. I felt that I had no alternative but to hand over the situation to him, which I did do. He then proceeded in accordance with their um, orders for opening fire and his troops took a certain number of paces backwards. And uh, he ordered them to open fire. They opened fire. And I remember thinking, oh my God, how long is this going, going to go on for?
remember being subjected to a feeling of utter dejection, I think is in a way I can describe it, that my, my career had, had come to, to this and that I could see no further future for myself in the, in the colonial service and um, for, for, for all that we stood for at that time and had been working for. In all, 51 Africans were killed by police and soldiers during the period of the arrests of Dr. Banda and his 1,300 colleagues of the Nyasaland Congress. In the next few days, an uneasy calm prevailed. Many whites were determined to behave as if things were back to normal. But they weren't. For months, the colonial office had been promising to send a minister with something to offer the Africans. I was over in Kenya and didn't know what was happening. And then I remember very well that Alan Lennox Boyd, who was my boss, got onto the telephone with great difficulty to me and said, you've got to hurry up and go over to Nyasaland. The whole of the country is in an uproar. I found things quieter than I expected, but clearly there had been the three or four days of great anxiety. I went pretty well to each one of the provinces, and uh, I remember very well going to one of the camps and finding a lot of people in, one, uh, in a big shed sitting down with nothing to do. And uh, I said to them, uh, well, they said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Lord Perth. And they said, oh, why didn't you come sooner? We've all been waiting for you. The Nyasaland emergency thrust the Federation to the forefront of British politics. Thousands of people of all shades of opinion demonstrated in support of the Africans. One of the men accused of complicity in the so-called murder plot was by chance in London, campaigning against the Federation, barracked repeatedly by right-wing groups like the League of Empire Loyalists. During the... Uh... Uh, 14 or so months that I lived in London, uh, we did uh, create a lot of hostility to us uh, from certain organizations uh, that were being supported by the federal government and also by South Africa. On April the 8th, 1959, at the Royal Albert Hall, a meeting to protest against the emergency was disrupted by some of Kanyama Chume's noisiest opponents. Not only were some of them shouting, you know, Mau Mau, you know, go back home and that sort of thing, but a few of them came and unfolded this big uh, uh, a poster, Hank Chume for sedition. After that, there was, there, was, there was a scuffle, a scuffle between uh, them and uh, our supporters. And when I say supporters, there were more Europeans, or more British, uh, who came to support us, and perhaps, they, uh, perhaps African. Uh, and this did emphasize uh, the fact that uh, this particular group was an isolated group. It did not reflect the feel, feelings and wishes of the British people. Uh, and I'm glad to say they, they were so thoroughly humiliated that thereafter they gave us very, very little trouble. And all rather they were scared to try and they uh, attempt it again. Public disquiet about the Nyasaland emergency led to demands for an independent commission of inquiry. The government decided to appoint a judge, Sir Patrick Devlin, to investigate what had gone wrong. Devlin and his colleagues produced a report that rocked Parliament with its blunt main conclusions. Nyasaland was a police state, they said. The African population was totally opposed to federation. And there had been no murder plot. Lord Devlin, I suspect, thought that he was sitting in, in a British court of justice, say the old Bailey, and that he was examining witnesses as he would have examined them in such a court. Now, of course, this was in no way the situation or the conditions that ruled in the emergency in Nyasaland. In the House of Commons, the Labour Party in opposition backed the Africans. They claimed that Sir Robert Armitage had been under the thumb of Sir Roy Walensky when he declared the state of emergency. I must emphasize that the decision uh, to call an emergency 
was entirely mine. I had no pressure brought on me by the Secretary of State in London or by Walensky uh, in the Federation or any other uh, person who could possibly have a thought that they had some influence on me. The Devlin report was very, very important. In fact, it was crucial. Now, I would say it's one of the landmarks in the, in the, in the history of, uh, of Nyaslan. I happened to be in, uh, in Parliament uh, then, in the British Parliament then, sitting in a, a stranger's, uh, uh, well, let's say, distinguished stranger's galleries uh, with uh, Sir Robert Armitage, who was then the governor. He had issued a, uh, a counter report to the Devlin Commission. And it was really a very pathetic sight, seeing this man being destroyed by people like uh, Nerin Bevan, uh, and that uh, really uh, he was absolutely, uh, or I think was really absolutely hopeless. I didn't um, mind being attacked personally. Uh, the thing that annoyed me most of the whole episode uh, was when Devlin said that Nyasland was a police state. Now that infuriated me. Well, I thought it was unfair, in fact, uh, insofar as it said that uh, the Asseland was a police state, uh, which I think was um, very much exaggerated, uh, the situation. Uh, and it caused an awful lot of trouble, of course, in Parliament, a frightful rise in both houses. Within months of the Devlin report, a major change occurred in the British view of white settler colonies. It became publicly known when Prime Minister Harold Macmillan toured Africa early in 1960. I spoke in some of my speeches what I called the wind of change, which is blowing through the continent. The speech which I made in Cape Town to the two houses of the South African Parliament has attracted some attention. And this was perhaps because I made it plain that there were differences of view between our two countries on certain subjects. When I read that speech in Rhodesian Herald, I guessed what was going to happen. When he came to Blanta, he was left in no doubt at all, the reaction of the people, because they told him that he must release me or else there would be no peace in Yasna. So that speech, to me, meant that it was just a matter of time before even I would be coming out of well. The Wind of Change speech signaled the British government's recognition that it could no longer help white settlers resist African nationalism. The man to implement this shift of policy was Macmillan's new colonial secretary, Ian MacLeod. He immediately wanted to accelerate the rate of release of all detainees, and in particular of Dr. Banda. Uh, I fought him all the way on this because I was determined keep some stability in the country. Armitage, supported by his police chiefs, warned that the release of the detainees, especially Banda, would make Nyasaland ungovernable, but MacLeod overruled him. We eventually reached agreement on a phased program of release for the detainees, but I had to accept that Banda should be released early. McLeod's judgment proved correct. Nyasaland remained calm when Banda was freed and shortly brought to London. For well, we are at last raising the barrier which has unfortunately lain for so long across the road of constitutional <coughs> progress in the territory. I made it plain when I came here that I came here in the spirit of give and take. Of course, everybody knows that. We are not getting what we wanted. But I'm happy to go back home and tell my people I did not get everything. But I was dealing with a man who understood our point of view. Banda received from McLeod assurances that if he was patient, he would, before too long, get what he wanted for Nyasaland. The whites of the Federation were now all the more determined to hold together their heartlands, the two Radishas. While the troubles in Nyasaland grabbed the headlines, 
northern Rhodesia too had been exploding. Here, African opposition to federation had been equally strong. The black miners on the copper belt had for some years merged their industrial grievances with anti-federal feelings. Political strikes repeatedly halted the mines, the federation's most vital economic asset. But the federal government film unit maintained that all was well. To become a boss boy is the ambition of most Africans. It carries responsibility and higher pay and brings them into closer contact with their European supervisors, whose ability and authority they respect. The companies provide accommodation for the Africans with comforts and facilities that they have never known before, thus making for happiness and contentment. Industrial disputes in northern Rhodesia posed a threat to Britain's supply of copper. Strikes by the black mine workers could always be controlled by force. But similar disruptions from the largely South African white supervisors could not. The colonial government had to listen to the voice of the European settlers. So Arthur Benson was our governor, and uh, he invited us as one group of contending organizations for political power. There were about four or five of us. After a few exchanges, Sir Arthur Benson turned around to me very sharply and said, Mr. Kawunda, don't you think that if we met your demands now, settlers would paralyze my government? I said, hello? Your Excellency, do you mean to say that uh, you will only listen to the African majority? If we were in a position to paralyze your government, he shall pretend away from me again and uh, did not reply. That stuck into my mind. The British government hoped it could stand in the middle by making some concessions to African demands whilst assuring the whites that they would still be safely in command. In the teeth of fierce settler opposition, Britain announced that for the first time, a small number of Africans would be elected to the Legislative Council. But the militant nationalists who followed Kenneth Kaunda rejected these concessions, instituted a new wave of strikes, and called for a boycott of the elections. Outraged by their strong-arm methods, the governor described Kaunda and his supporters as murder incorporated. He had the leaders picked up and exiled to remote rural areas where it was thought they would have difficulty communicating with the local inhabitants. Word had gone around uh, through the, what they call the district messengers, through the district commissioner, that uh, people should get away, should run away from me, because I ate, I loved human flesh, especially that of children. <laughs> so each time I went, me as a group of children in a runaway, I began to find out and uh, discovered the story that had been spread uh, about me. And uh, of course, <laughs> I took a different strategy, I began uh, meeting schoolboys and uh, organized them through them, their parents. So within three months of my stay there, the, uh, there were a number of units, little branches formed of the youth of the Zambia African National Congress. With the black radicals of northern Rhodesia safely out of the way, the settlers confidently looked forward to the review of the Federation, at which they expected to gain independence and not have to worry any more about Whitehall's nagging interest in African advancement. With white control of northern and southern Rhodesia confirmed, the rider would stay firmly astride the horse. Before the review, Britain appointed a royal commission on the future of the Federation. Walensky was determined that it must not consider any of the territories being allowed to break away. I got categorical assurances in 1953 that the British government accepted that there could be no secession unless there was agreement by all the governments that made up the Federation. That is a categorical statement. Walensky therefore felt he had been double-crossed when the Commission, far from endorsing federal independence, recommended that Nyasaland and Northern Rhodesia should be offered the possibility of secession from the Federation. You couldn't uh, guarantee that secession 
uh, would not arise. Witnesses uh, were brought before the commission, uh, and you couldn't tell what they were going to say. What you, we did say was that the uh, um, commission would not um, uh, recommend secession. That was not in their terms of reference to be able to do that. Well, they got very near it. They, they recommended it as an option at a future date. But um, so um, I can see what uh, Roy, uh, Roy Walensky's uh, grievance. I don't admit its validity. The Conference on the Future of Federation finally took place in London in December 1960. It rapidly broke up in disarray. The Federals were now resigned to the secession of Nyasaland, but they were desperate to hold on to northern Rhodesia and its vital copper revenue. Kenneth Cowander was equally desperate to prevent them. The settlers have their troops and guns with which to enforce federation. We are fully determined to break up the federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland. Ian MacLeod had himself experienced the force of Kaunda's popular support when he met the leader of the nationalist women's movement, Julia Chickamonica, known as Mama Yunip. On the subject of Northern Rhodesia, MacLeod faced irreconcilable demands. He therefore did his best to tell both sides what they wanted to hear. I started off by liking the new Secretary of State and uh, I believed that we were going to be able to work together. He seemed to show an understanding of our problems and uh, I felt that it was, I, it was my duty to get on as good a possible terms as I could with him. But quite frankly it didn't last very long because uh, I began to discover a whole host of things that indicated very clearly to me that he wanted things to go at a great, much greater speed than I felt was either safe or good for Central Africa. Uh, I mean, if you want to put it in a nutshell, I think that um, uh, Macmillan was a wind of change man and MacLeod was a, a gale of change uh, man. The Conservative cabinet was now split down the middle. Lord Hume and many ministers backed Walensky. But for MacLeod and the Prime Minister, the time was past when Britain could take the white settlers' side. The Africans could now paralyze northern Rhodesia. At one stage, I said in London, if violence broke out in the North Rhodesia, it would make Mau Mau look like a Sunday morning children's picnic. It wasn't very popular in British circles. <laughs> and uh, I remember Ian McLeod <laughs> hammering me very hard on this one. I said, I meant it when I said. <laughs> he was saying I should apologize to the British public. I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm just telling you facts. Compelled to choose between the white settlers and the Africans, McLeod came down on the side of the black majority. Many British conservatives regarded McLeod as a traitor to his race. The two Rhodesias had more white settlers than any other British colony. These people were Britain's kith and kin. They believed they had been promised a secure future in charge of the Federation. MacLeod's decision to pass control to the Africans outraged half his own party. Their anger was expressed in the House of Lords on the 7th of March, 1961. The debate was a general one on the uh, white paper we'd done on, on the Constitution for Northern Rhodesia. And I, uh, if I didn't lead off, I was one of the first speakers. And I defended our record and so on and so forth. Uh, I thought pretty well. And then uh, Lord Salisbury got up. And uh, really, to our surprise, he made a very, very strong attack on our policy, and in particular on Ian McLeod, my boss. 
the white Rhodesians feel suspicion, contempt, almost hatred of the home government. The main responsibility must rest on the present colonial secretary. He has been too clever by half. Ian McLeod, as you recall, was said to be a very good card player, but this wasn't the way to, 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 to uh, negotiate on, on such important things. And it, it was a very, if you want, a, a very damaging and, and, and hurtful uh, speech. Within months, McLeod was removed from the colonial office. His career was permanently damaged. But the momentum he had given to the Africans in northern Rhodesia was unstoppable. In 1962, the colony got its first African majority government. The British political party, on which Walensky had relied to keep the whites in charge in northern Rhodesia, had let him down. To me, the fact that they kept on patting me on the back, telling me, swearing to me how loyal they were to the Federation and how much they wanted to continue its, uh, it being alive, whilst they were busy turning the knife in my back. I, of course, have got to admit that in many ways I was naive, uh, because I, the only thing that I can plead in my own defense is that I had dealt with honorable men in the past, men like Alec Hume, men that I respected and whose word I would have taken. I wasn't perhaps a match for these gentlemen, particularly those who are extremely good at playing cards. Eventually, the deputy prime minister, R.A. Butler, was brought in to sort out the mess. The conflicting promises made by British ministers were now falling due. When I came here in 1916, I said I'd come in the spirit of give and take. This time, I've come in the spirit of take. Nyasaland, at last, four years after Dr. Banda's return, was allowed to leave the Federation. But even at this 11th hour, Walensky was still coming up with schemes for retaining northern Rhodesia. Butler gave him no comfort. Without any preliminaries, he's just read out a statement to us, advising us that the British cabinet had met the previous day and they had agreed that it was absolutely essential to give all the territories the right to secede. And of course, the, I had no doubts that that was the death knell of the Federation in any shape or form. I was given no opportunity to present my own proposals or anything else. Uh, so one of the first things I said to him, because we did continue the discussion, and one of the first things I said to him was, Secretary of State, I'd be grateful if you'd ask one of your officials to convey to the British Prime Minister that neither my delegation or I will be attending his lunch because I don't eat with people who stab me in the back. You are a disappointed man, I take it. Yes, I'm not, I'm not only a disappointed man, I feel that uh, I was brought here under false pretenses. Can you say anything at all about your own personal future now? Well, if people are concerned about me continuing in politics, I certainly don't intend to intervene in territorial politics. So it probably means the end of me politically. It's all right, thank you. Good night. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. There rise the Federation of Rhodesia and Yasna, dead, buried, stabbed in the back by Mr. McMillan. Well, it may have been crazily optimistic. I just said it was. I think probably it was. The idea of federation was good, but uh, the Africans did not like this partnership between the horse and the rider. They didn't like being horses. The Federation was founded on the concept of partnership, which meant, of course, consultation and the consent of the people. Well, there was no partnership. There was no consultation. There was no consent. I think it was a classical example of 
British political expediency. Diplomacy, if you like. I'm one of those people who says diplomacy is a word special to the British Foreign Office. They coined it. To me, it is a polite word for deception because that's certainly what happened to us over the Federation and I think there are many other people in the world who would echo the sentiment which I have just expressed. In 1964, Nyasaland became independent as Malawi and Northern Rhodesia as Zambia. Southern Rhodesia continued under the rule of the white settlers. bring you the final episode of End of Empire next Sunday when the 15-year rebellion of Rhodesia's whites is examined. And remember, the book of this series is available from the ABC shop in your capital city. Stay with us now for the mid-evening news, followed by Act Two of The Valkyrie in Wagner's Ring, simulcast with ABC FM.